Well, welcome back. Hopefully you all had a good lunch. Um, we're going to uh, pick it up and, and at least for the rest of the day, you're with me. So tomorrow we have a little bit of uh, diversity in our presenters, but um, for, for today I'm, I'm taking it into the end. So this next section, and I'm, I'm glad I, I see a lot of you brought your laptops. Um, this next session is all about um, how to use Unix and Linux on your um, laptop and you know, whether you have a PC or a Mac. Uh, does, it, does anybody have a Linux laptop? Okay, so one person. Um, so yeah, it's not, not typical um, that uh, people install. I mean, I don't even install Linux on my laptop. There's just not, uh, not enough of a justification. But many of the scientific software that, that um, is used, um, particularly in protein analytical labs, uh, and in my lab, a lot of the NMR spectroscopy software is run on uh, a different operating system called Linux. And so <clears throat> I often find that you know, students get very, very little exposure uh, to this operating system as undergrads. Uh, and so when they come in as graduate students or they come in as new undergrads, uh, into the lab, they've never seen it before, and so they're entirely lost. And they sort of just, well, I don't want to learn that, so they don't, they'll never pick it up. Um, and it's not that they're, they're, they're not smart students or they're not motivated, it's just that it's so different from what they're used to that um, unless you have a little bit of sort of hand-holding going into it, it's, it's really hard to get, overcome the activation energy, energy to start working on it. Um, so that's why I made this part of the session. Um, we're going to uh, briefly overview uh, Linux and what you can do with it. And then a good part of this session is going to be uh, you guys following through um, the instructions, which are up here. Um, I guess I have one extra copy. Uh, if you have a Mac and you have this handout, you don't need it. Uh, if you don't have a Mac, so this is the installing an X SSH X window environment on Windows PC. If you don't have a Mac, um, try to get this from somebody who does if you don't have it. Um, and so we're going to try to just install this. And then if, hopefully there's some time at the end we can show you a little bit about what you can do um, with Linux. And um, you've all, well, if you've registered uh, for the, for the boot camp uh, before today, uh, you all have a temporary account on my uh, Unix system or my Linux system back in the lab. Uh, and so you'll be able to access that for the next 30 days and sort of practice if you want. Um, so uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, so um, the Linux, Linux is an operating system. Um, and when you think about operating systems, I mean, it looks like, you know, this year actually most people in the, in the audience with the laptop are using a, a Windows laptop. Um, oftentimes it's sort of a 50-50 mix. Uh, so this year is kind of unique in that sense. But when we think of an operating system, we, we often think about two different types of, of interfaces to the operating system. So the operating system is what controls uh, the hardware on your computer. So it's, it sits at the lowest level, uh, right above the hardware, and it takes you know, programs um, you know, that you might run, say Microsoft Word or a browser, and it interfaces between the browser and the Microsoft Word and the actual hardware of the computer. And so, um, and you know, we've so gotten so used to this that it's, it's been sort of second nature. Uh, in the early days of computing, I mean, that was a really, really big deal. Uh, and so, um, you know, and it wasn't at all obvious that, that um, you would have that nice interface to the hardware. Uh, the earliest, um, you know, DEC systems, you didn't have an operating system. You programmed the computer directly uh, using switches on the front. Uh, and so the idea that something would sit there and be running all the time and would make it easy for your software to run um, was quite novel when it was first proposed. Um, nowadays, we just when we think operating system, we think Windows or PC or, or Windows or Mac. Um, but even there, the operating system has multiple interfaces under the hardware. Most of you are probably most familiar with the, the window interface. Uh, where you have the graphics and the nice, you know, clean windows, the start bar or the the, um, the icons on your desktop. Um, but both Macintosh and Windows also have a command line interface. 
And you know, even when I was in middle school, high school, uh, you know, Windows existed, um, but the primary interface to use the computer was was through the command line using a an interface called DOS. Um, <clears throat> and you know, a, a narrative of modern operating system design has been more and more to hide this from the end user. Uh, and that's great. I mean, it makes computers easier to use and your grandma can use it. But uh, if you're a scientist, there are lots of reasons why you would want to access the command line interface. Um, particularly with lots and lots of data sets. You know, I can go into my, my NMR and I can generate literally a thousand graphics um, of different types of spectra in, you know, 30 seconds. Um, and I don't want to be clicking on each, you know, suppose I have to rename those or copy them. Um, if I want to rename them, I don't want to be clicking on each one and renaming them individually. I want to be able to access the keyboard and tell my computer, okay, rename all these files from this pattern to this pattern. That's very straightforward on a command line interface, but if you have to click them and hit, hit F2 or hit the rename key and rename one and then rename the next one, you're going to be there all day. Uh, and so the command line interface has, has a lot of advantages uh, over the windowing interface, although the windowing interface certainly has lots of advantages as well. Uh, and so modern operating systems always will have both, uh, even Windows and Mac. Uh, it's just that for Windows and Mac, it's a little bit harder, um, or, or maybe you're not necessarily aware of the fact that there's a command line interface lurking underneath. <clears throat> and so, you know, we talk about Windows, talking about Mac, you probably all know about those. Um, why, why do we need a third one? Um, and and we, we call this Unix, and I, I throw around the term Unix and Linux interchangeably. Really, they are two different things. Um, Unix is a historical uh, commercial operating system that was developed back in the 70s, I believe, um, to do sort of large mainframe computing. Uh, and then, you know, Windows and Mac sort of came about later. Um, Linux is essentially a, uh, a clone of the original Unix operating system uh, that interfaces and looks the same, um, but is non-commercial and is, and is freely available, right? And so, um, so when I throw around Linux and Unix, you know, you can, for, for the purposes of this workshop, unless I say explicitly one way or the other, you can kind of assume that they're essentially the same, same thing. Um, most you know, academic labs, if they're running a Unix-like operating system, they're running some flavor of Linux. And we'll see what that means here in a few minutes. Um, so, but why? Why do we care? Why, why not uh, just run Windows or Mac all the time? Uh, well, one of the historical reasons, I mean, it's been around forever, and so it's, it's traditionally been much more stable. Now, newer versions of Windows and newer versions of Mac uh, have, have come great, great miles in, in terms of their stability. But, you know, back when I was in college, it wasn't uncommon for your, your Windows system to be up for about a couple of days, and then it would crash, and you'd have to restart it. And then you would, you know, and, and uh, you know, I still have a Windows 2000 computer back in my in-laws, and it's sort of wild. It runs Windows, at, uh, Windows yeah, Windows 2000, it runs like one of the original versions of, um, Firefox, so like Firefox version 3. And it's incredible because, you know, you're just using it and all of a sudden it stops working. And, you know, in 20 years we've gotten used to computers that are quite stable and they, they don't crash all the time. Um, I also have a Windows 3.1 system in my in-law's basement too, and someday I'll get it out. But, but um, he's happy, my, my father-in-law's happy enough to keep it in there for now. Uh, but that's even worse, right? You're, you're running Windows for like five minutes and all of a sudden you go to a web page and all of a sudden the computer shuts down. Um, and so uh, Unix has historically been much more stable than that. And if you're running a, a simulation and it needs to run for weeks on end, you need to make sure that your system isn't going to crash unexpectedly in the middle of that. Uh, so so uh, for high, high performance scientific computing, Unix has been sort of historically what's used. Um, it, it's also historically had the um, had multitasking, uh, so the ability to run multi -pro multiple programs at once uh, for for the longest amount of time. Um, maybe, I guess maybe if, that, if you count VAX, it would be longer. But but of those three, it's going to be longer. Um, 
and it's it's extremely flexible. So, you know, I have a I have a Linux system at home running on a Raspberry Pi computer. It's about this big, and it doesn't have a monitor. It doesn't have a keyboard, uh, and it hooks directly into my TV, and it lets me play like old Nintendo games. Um, and so that's running Linux. At the same time, my my um, my lab has you know a, a 12 processor server with with you know gigs and gigs of memory uh, that we use for computation. That's running Linux, a much more traditional computing environment. Um, my my wireless router at home is also running Linux, right? So so all of these things are running different flavors of Linux. It's extremely flexible for embedded systems for traditional computing, um, and and so you can really tweak it, uh, what's installed, what's not installed, much more finely than you can pick um, a Macintosh or, or a Windows computer. Uh, if you want to do that on a, on a Windows, you have to buy a special version of Windows for embedded systems. So uh, it's, it's very flexible in that regard. Um, lots of science people, very familiar with Linux. Uh, if you do any kind of molecular simulation, it's, it's what you use. You probably don't even have PCs in your lab. Um, but you know, in my lab, we do we do a mix, and and personally, I think PCs or PCs or Macs are still better for things like running Microsoft Word, uh, Adobe Illustrator, some graphics projects or programs. But um, but the data analysis, the data processing, uh, is is almost exclusively at Linux in my lab. Um, <clears throat> you know, it handles lots of files well. Uh, Linux has been able to support extremely large file systems for for decades. Uh, and so, you know, whereas FAT32, if you throw in something, I think, bigger than 64 gigabytes, it, it dies. So that's why, you know, lots of systems don't run uh, FAT32 anymore, which is the original Windows file system, or, or I guess Windows 95 file system. Um, and so, you know, and then historically, I mean, scientists are slow to change. Uh, what can I say? So earlier I mentioned that there's flavors of Linux. Um, Again, Linux is free software. It was developed as an academic uh, research project and, and teaching project back, I think, in the, the 80s. Um, and you know, the guy said, hey, I want to come up with a free version of, of that, that runs like Linux that I can use to teach my students how, how Unix operating systems and how operating systems in general work. And so he came up with the, the, the system. Um, but Linux itself only really refers to what's called the kernel. And so the kernel is basically the baseline uh, program that interfaces, again, other programs running on the computer and the raw hardware. And so another, comp another program wants to allocate some memory or use some memory to do something. Maybe you want to load a picture on a web page. It needs to load some memory to do that. It, it makes a call to the operating system. The operating system allocates the memory and talks back to the system and, or talks back to the program and says, OK, here's the address you can use. Uh, if two computer or two programs are running on the computer at the same time, the operating system is, is what decides what runs when, right? And so while you're waiting, or, or while um, while the computer is waiting for you to click on something on a web page, the operating system is going to wait and say, "Oh, look, they're, they're they're not doing anything. Let me run something else in the background." Uh, and then they're all the operating system is also going to say, "Hey, look, he pressed the button, or she pressed the button." Let me go back to that program where she pressed the button or he pressed the button. Uh, and so it's only that core program. And you can imagine there's lots and lots of other programs running on top of it that do things like you know, show, you what, um, show you the background or the graphical interface. Um, you know, if you're running a, a server or some kind of uh, program like in the background to, to handle print jobs, um, all of that stuff sort of sits on top of the kernel and then actually allows you to use the software. Even the command line interface itself is another piece of software that's interfacing with the kernel. And so the kernel describes sort of the, the, the lowest part of what runs on the computer, and then other programs are built on top of it. Uh, and so we can imagine, you know, for Windows, Windows also has a kernel, and you know, the Explorer, if you ever heard that program, that's the graphical interface in Windows. Uh, but there's also programs that allow you to access command line interface, you know, CMD or command.com. Um, so uh, those are all running on top. 
But since Linux is open, it's free, anybody can access the source code, anybody can make their own, ver well, anybody with the sufficient expertise, like I couldn't do it, but, but lots of people can come together and make their own sort of uh, collection of programs that run on top of the kernel, um, and, they, and they can package those and say, okay, you can run my version of Linux, or you can run this person's version of Linux, or you can run this person's version of Linux, and they're all, they're all fine-tuned to different um, optimum applications. And so these are called distributions, or a lot of times you'll, you'll hear thrown around distros. Um, and, and they're all running on the same kernel, if they're Linux, but they can look very, very different depending on the types of programs that are running on top of the kernel. Okay, and so we'll, we'll talk about what, what some of those look like. Um, you know... There, there's, uh, there's very little, you know, the internet is extremely democratic, right? So, so it's not like the United States where we have a two-party system and, and there's, there's very political and structural reasons why we always have a two-party system. Um, on the internet, if somebody says, hey, I want to make a new distribution of Linux, um, you know, there's really nothing stopping them. And so when you think about distributions of Linux, you can see, I mean, this is basically a, a chart showing all of the distributions that have evolved over the years. And they've all sort of started from a few historical, I think that one's Slackware, the one above is Debian. Um, they've all evolved from a few uh, very small uh, number of distributions. But then somebody said, well, you know, I really like Debian, but I kind of like to make it a little bit more focused towards, um, you know, towards gaming. Or I'd like my version of Debian to be a little bit more focused towards, uh, you know, uh, video editing. And so they might, they might, you know, fork the distribution one way or the other and make their own version that might be optimized for, for one set of hardware or one set of applications. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, my first distribution was Slackware. Uh, it was kernel version 1.2.3. Uh, and so it's quite old at this point. I started using Linux in, in high school, really. Um, although I wasn't really a big super user then. I mean, it took me a lot of years to get practice and, and experience using it. Um, but, and Slackware is still around, although uh, right now in my lab, we use a derivative of, of Debian uh, called Ubuntu. Um, but you can see, I mean, that, those are just two options out of a, a huge array of possibilities that you could select from. Um, common distributions, uh, CentOS or CentOS um, is what runs on our NMR systems over in the uh, um, in the NMR facility. Uh, it's actually quite old at this point, so we one of the one of the tasks for the summer is maybe trying to upgrade those computers. Um, but the 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 philosophy behind CentOS is we want to make something that's stable and is not going to crash ever if we can avoid it. Right? And so it's not going to incorporate some newer features, like you know, the versions, the computers over there have USB 3 ports, so they can run USB 3, very fast USB connections. But CentOS, the version that we're running, uh, even though it was only, I mean, it was discontinued last year, even though it was only discontinued last year, it doesn't support USB 3. So it's, it's, it's stable at the expense of adding newer features and newer hardware support. Um, and then other types of this distribution sort of dial that knob differently. Um, you know, Ubuntu, which is what I use in my lab, um, really wants to be as user-friendly as possible. And since I have a lot of graduate students who've never touched Linux before, I want, you know, I want to make sure that they can, you know, at least be functional. And so, so that's one of the reasons I chose Ubuntu. Um, Debian is... is you know, known for its ability to sort of incorporate the latest features, the latest options, the latest hardware support, uh, and it's extremely useful in, in, in its flexibility. Um, and so it has lots of choices, uh, and it's very similar in, in many ways to Ubuntu, but, um, you know, if, if you're on the sort of Debian update stream, you might not be surprised if you do an update and you restart the computer and something doesn't work right away. Uh, and so, so you've got to watch out for that with Debian. Um, you know, other, other distributions that are out there, um, FreeBSD isn't really a Linux distribution, it's actually a different kernel, um, at least I'm pretty sure it's a different kernel, but it's, it's a different flavor that, that gives you that same kind of Linux feel. Um, you know, I've used Fedora, um, and so I've used one, one, two, four, and five, 
Uh, but this sort of has you know, some ideas that, that the different distributions are, are favoring different types of things. And so you know, free, free BSD is, is um, you know, often sort of the, it, you know, it's touted for its security features and its stability. And so, so a lot of people that do like really hardcore and they want hardened servers will try to run some version of FreeBSD because of that. <clears throat> okay, so um, here again, it's, it's distinctions. Um, you know, we can talk about a Linux-like environment. Uh, and so both Mac and uh, PCs have, have sort of operating modes that you can use them. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, it feels like a Linux-like environment. And in many cases, this can be like the best of both worlds. Because I'm never going to give up my Adobe software. I'm never going to give up Microsoft Word. And I, I technically don't have to if I switch to Linux. But, um, but it's just a little harder to run it. Uh, but that operating system can provide a set of programs that looks like Linux, feels like Linux, but still the core kernel um, is the original uh, kernel that, that corresponds to the operating system. And so, uh, and Mac, um, you know, for, for many years it was built on the, the mock kernel, uh, which was actually developed at my alma mater at CMU. Um, but now it's called XNU. Um, and it, it has a built-in shell scripting environment uh, right there. And if you ever opened up the terminal in Mac, um, you know, it's, it's, that's essentially what Linux feels like right there. Windows has, has a, a new uh, Linux subsystem, or I guess relatively new sub subsystem. I've never really played with it. Um, I actually mostly use Sigwin, which is what that handout will walk us through here uh, in a minute. So just some, some history. You can sort of see uh, where, where things developed along the way. Um, yeah, so, so Unix came back in 1969. Um, you know, now we're in the, the we're actually beyond this, but um, but Linux came into the into the scene right around '91, uh, and so very early '90s, uh, and then it sort of has grown from there to be a pretty pretty significant, although not dominant player in the operating system um, field. Okay, so you know this is all nice. It's nice to understand history, where things are coming, where things are going. Uh, but we'd like to really get to the point where you guys can, can play with a command line environment, play with uh, Linux, and, and, and see, what, see what you think about it. Uh, and so, Max, um, you guys, well, again, it doesn't look like there's many Mac. Does anybody here have an Apple system? Okay, so one in the back, and then one there. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Um, and uh, so you guys are going to be a little bit on your own, um, but, you know, the nice thing is you, you have a much easier step to get there. Um, so, so, you know, you're, you're not going to have, I mean, like many things on Mac, you guys talk about your simplicity. This is actually way simpler than what the PC users have to do. Um, so, basically you need to go to the Applications Utilities folder, and if you run the program Terminal in that folder, you bring up uh, a command line interface. And, um, and then to get X running, uh, you use a program called Xquartz, uh, which used to be included as part of the Mac distribution, but um, now you have to download it separately. Uh, and so uh, your task, while all of the PC users are struggling to install Sigwin, is to, um, to open up the terminal and then start up Xquartz, um, or, or download and install Xquartz. And, and I'll be around to answer questions if you have problems doing that. And then the other thing you want to grab is the file transfer client called Fugu, uh, which is a type of blowfish. And um, that will allow you to transfer files uh, back and forth between a, a Linux system um, or another uh, you know, SSH running system and your own computer. So, so you're, you got it pretty much made in the shade. Um, PC users, a little bit more difficult is, is an understatement. Um, we have a handout here. Does anybody need a copy of this, this handout? Installing an SSH? Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is going to be a big fun mess. Um, and actually this is going to be interesting because this is the first year I've... So I rewrote that handout uh, and we're doing things a little bit differently this year. 
And, and one of the reasons I continue this, well, this is like my, I, I like teaching this session, but this is my least favorite session because these guys keep changing the installation software. Um, and so I haven't tested the, the instructions um, on that page, but we're gonna try running it and see what happens. Um, but basically you're gonna go to um, a website called sigwin.com, you're gonna download the installer, and you're going to install Sigwin on your computer. And, um, and that should be outlined. I mean, I've done it before, so it's not like I'm gone. It's not like you're like trying something totally new on that sheet. Uh, it's just whether I've checked all the boxes and, and everything is done. But, um, but yeah, you'll go through that, and by the time you're done with that, you should have something that works. Um, and then your file transfer client, if you're running Windows, is called WinSCP. And so after you get SigWin installed, you want to go to WinSCP and download the software and install. And that's just like a installing any other uh, PC software. So that, that's pretty easy. Okay, so uh, that's, that's it. While you guys, so I'd say, um, does everybody have a handout? Okay, so, so if you need a handout, you don't have one, talk to your neighbor. Looks like there's enough of them out there. While you guys are doing that, uh, I'm gonna, I have uh, username and password information for, for my system. Uh, and so I'm going to hand these out uh, to you, uh, and I'll and I'll be going around. And you know, if you have questions, raise your hand. I'll I'll help you. But but start following the instructions on that uh, start you know X11 environment on uh, Windows, and we'll uh, hopefully reach a, reach a, uh, a point. Anyway, if you're on a Mac, uh, and I know there's a couple people with Macs, um, what you want to do is you want to start exports. So go to you know, from your finder window, go to Go, Utilities, and Exports is in there. Um, and then once you start Exports, uh, under, you know, that'll bring up a, an Applications window. And then from Applications window, you can start Xterm from within Exports. So it's, it's similar in, in um, function to how it works once you have it installed on SigWin. Um, once SigWin gets started, hopefully I have it installed here. <laughs> You'll start up the SigWin X11 server. And then that should bring up the uh, little buttons here down on the desktop. And there's two of them. Um, both of them should start up. Um, you know, maybe after, after class we can talk about, you know, if there's errors, I can work with each one individually. Um, but uh, normally getting it installed is the hard part. And so once you have that, that icon logo in your, in your uh, start menu, it, you know, nine times out of ten, it just works. Um, and then you right click on that, you bring up the X term. And again, for me, I have bad vision. Well, I mean, I don't know that it's terrible, but, but it's bad enough that I don't really want to, uh, want to um, mess around with it. So I usually go immediately here to VT fonts and then bring that up to huge. And that makes it much easier to read. And again, Right now, you all have uh, an account, um, with the exception of maybe one or two, um, to the block server. And that's going to be uh, a simple matter of typing SSH. Uh, and you want to type dash Y, because that's what tells you to forward graphical connections from one computer to the other. Um, you have to do that, otherwise it's not going to, you know, the, forwarding a graphical connection is inherently something that you don't want to give everybody the right to do, right? You don't want some random machine out there on the internet putting up a window that looks like it's an operating system window and asking you for privileged information. So the Y says, I trust this server to send graphical data to my, my computer. And so that's why you want to specify that. And then in my case, it's um, my username is nfitsky. Uh, and then the computer name is block. Yeah. 
And I mistyped my password, but oh well. And so if all works well, I mean, your, your computer might not have all this data, but you know, if all works well, you'll be faced with a prompt here at the end. Right? And, and you can tell that you're logged into my computer because it has your username and then block, which is the name of my computer. Unless your computer happens to be named block2, but, but I imagine you're probably not naming your computers after NMR uh, spectroscopists. So, um, and from here, you know, this is actually quite powerful because, you know, we, the demo or the, the, uh, the, the handout says, hey, look, you can run this XIs program, which allows you to, I, mean, I think it opened up off the screen, but I can fix that. There we go. You know, which allows you to, you know, follows your mouse around kind of dopey. Um, and that's, that's cool. But, you know, the real power of this is, you know, my computer has a copy of a program called Topspin, right? And so I can run, and your computer might not have Topspin installed, right? So I can open up Topspin, and now it's running on my computer allowing me to process NMR spectra on, on my computer over in HandLab, but all the graphics are being displayed on your computer. And so you can interface with it uh, through a remote system. And now you don't have to, you don't have to have the software installed on your own system. You can install, you can use the version that's installed on mine. In the next session, we're going to use a program called Newplot, uh, which you can install on your computer, but you can also run it on my computer if you want, right? Um, you know, my computer also has, you know, programs on like um, Mathematica, right? Which maybe you don't want to install that on your computer, um, but this way you can run it on mine. Now, I'm not sure. I haven't updated my... Uh, I haven't updated my license on this computer for a long time, so it uh, might not work. Um, yeah, so uh, I got to do that. But um, MATLAB should definitely work because we don't have the same kind of licensing for Mississippi State on MATLAB. And so here again, you can run on another computer and have the graphics displayed on your computer in a point where you can, you know, you don't have to worry about licensing or, or you can let the other computer worrying about, worry about licensing. So, um, so once you have access, you know, one of the, one of the handouts on the, um, on the page gives you a whole bunch of Unix-like commands, right? And um, I don't want to overshoot our time too much here. Yeah, we have two, 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 250. So I'm going to overshoot our time a little bit. But once you're at this type of a thing, this is the command line interface. And the way the command line interface works is that you type commands, you type names of files, and, and you give it flags. And the computer reads that command um, as though you had maybe done some kind of like click on a file in a, in a window somewhere. Right, so you know, if I want to look at the files in my home directory, right, and this this contains this little prompt contains information about my home directory, right. So it has my username, it has the server, and this little tilde is Unix code for your home directory. So where all of your files are stored. Think of it as like my documents on your computer. Right? And so if I want to look at the files in the My Documents directory on my Linux system, the command to do that is type ls. Right? And so ls stands for list. And if I do that, there's a ton of files. Right? I mean, I have, I mean I've been using this for seven years. Um, and you can see there's a lot of files here. 
On this particular Unix server, it does things like color codes the files, right? So in this case, I know that blue files or blue things, those are actually other subfolders, right? So this is be just like if you had a window of files on your Windows system or your Mac, and it says, okay, well, there's a PDF file, but there's a subdirectory called active. There's a subdirectory called artsy examples. Uh, there's a subdirectory called 2017.0707 BCL, right? So, so this is telling me something about the files. Um, in this particular example, red means archive files or zip files, right? And so uh, if you look at the files in your home directory, and we can take a look here. Uh, I don't have the files in your home directory, but I can go check out. A uh, home boot camp and under 2018. And if I do ls, those are all your net IDs, right? So those are your home directories. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I can type cd for change directory. And let's see. Let's go to, Q, uh, Quinn, that's you, QW115? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I can type QW115, or I can type QW and hit tab, and it allows me to complete that without having to type the whole thing. And now I can type LS, and I can look at all the files in Quinn's directory. All right? Uh, I can, you know, and, and when I made these, I, made, I gave you all the same files, right? So if I look under here, under SJW278, so Savannah's directory, it's the same directory, right? Same set of files. Now, they aren't exactly the same files. If Savannah goes in and deletes them, they're not going to delete Quinn's version, right? That's basic, basic operating system security. Um, but, you know, you can see by using the CD or change directory command, and then giving it a, you know, a subdirectory or a parameter that's a directory underneath, I can navigate the file system, right? So by typing cd sjw278, it says go to the subdirectory called sjw278. Now one thing you notice here is there's a cd dot dot, right? So cd dot dot means go the directory up. So I'm in Savannah's directory right now. And if I'm ever confused about where I am, I can look here on my prompt, right? It says slash home slash bootcamp slash 2018 slash SJW278. I can also type the command PWD for print working directory. And that shows me what directory I'm in as well. And if I want to go one directory level up, I can type CD space dot dot and you can see I've gone from being in Savannah's directory SJW278 to being in just the 2018 bootcamp directory. I can type cd space dot dot and now I'm just in the bootcamp directory and if I type ls I can see what my options are for subdirectories right so as you might expect, I have 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. So let's say, oh, look, I wonder who's, who's, who took the course in 2017. Well, now I can type CD space 2017. I can type LS. And there are the people who took the course last year. Right? Now, again, I can't, as, as my user, I can't go in and start changing their files, and you won't be able to change their files either. Um, and you have to think about things, you know, do I want the 2017 people to be able to access the 2016 people file? I don't know. That's a question that you have to ask yourselves. Um, I'm pretty open with your permissions, but your account is di disabled in 30 days. So after 30 days, it really doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, if I have a group, like my, my research students are using something, and I have a, a collaborator that wants to use my computer for something, Maybe I want them to be able to access some of the files on my, my server, but not all of the files, right? So those are the types of questions that, 
that you have to ask, and if you're more advanced in Linux, you, you end up getting, getting into. Uh, but for your case, you know, just navigating directories, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, one thing, we've, we've wandered far, right, here. I mean, we haven't, we've typed like seven commands, but we're no longer in our home directory. How do I get back home? Well, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, one is to type cd and just hit enter. And if I type cd and hit enter, it takes me back home. And so you can see this directory is now just back to tilde. And if I type pwd to show my working directory, it's home and Fitzky. Uh, and that's my home directory. So I'm not in the boot camp directory, so I'm in my own home directory, right? I can also use that tilde feature as a very convenient um, shortcut, right? So if I type cd tilde slash temp, I can tell the, the, the command line to change the directory to my home directory slash the temporary subdirectory underneath my home directory. And if I do that and type ls, now you can see there's files there. If I type pwd, it's gone into tilde slash temp or home slash nfitsky slash temp. All right, so by using the change directory command cd, I can, I can basically navigate to any particular location on the file system um, and change my working directory to that location on the file system. So those are commands that are in your cheat sheet uh, and on, on, on the website if you don't have it. Uh, what do you do once you get into that file system, right? So, you know, all of the things that you would want to do in Windows, there has to be a way to do it here as well, right? So, for example, if I want to copy so let's go back to Savannah's directory. So cd slash home slash bootcamp slash 2018 slash sjw. And I don't remember the number after Savannah's name, but I don't have to. I hit sjw and hit tab. It completes it for me. And so now I'm in her directory. If I want to copy a file, so I can see that there's several files here. Uh, there's a, there's a, a gzipped archive. Uh, there's a file called binding.txt that will come up in the next session, uh, a linear text, a hello.txt. If I want to copy a file, I can use the, the copy command, which is not cd, but cp, right? cp for copy. And I can type copy, and then I type a file, which is my sourced file, test underscore data.txt. And if I want to copy that to my home directory, I type tilde and then slash. And that's going to copy this file from the source location, which is in the current working directory, to my home directory as with the slash past it. And that slash is needed because that specifies that you're, you're telling it to copy it to a directory location, not to overwrite my home directory with test data. Now, you're not going to be able to do that, so don't worry about it. But if, if I leave that tilde off, oh, look, it worked. Oh, that's cool. Um, if I don't, if I, put the, if I put the slash on, it works too. And now if I look in my home directory, so if I type ls tilde, there's still a lot, a lot of files there. But you'll see one of the files is test underscore data, which is the file I copied from Savannah. Now, how do I know what's in any of these files? Well, like on your Windows system, you can run programs to read files, right? So I have some PDF files here. So here's a PDF called SUP07 Wutrich JDBMNMR2003, right? Now, if I try typing acro read, oops, which is the name of the Adobe Reader on Unix, and then I mouse over this guy, so I select it, and then I'm going to press the middle mouse button. Just going to push it down. And that copies and pastes it to the, to the command line. Now what's going to happen here? Anybody want to make a prediction? No. 
It's not going to work, right? Because that file that I got, I copied the file name, that came from my home directory. But my current working directory is an SJW278, right? So when I try to hit this, it's going to say file not found. Or it's going to say command not found. Maybe I don't have Acrobat Reader on here. Yeah, okay, I have events, so that's an Acrobat Reader too. Now if I type events and then this, it's going to say file not found. Yep, so it says unable to open this document because no such file or directory. Right? So if I want to open that file, I can either go into the window and, and navigate to the actual file location, or I can type CD, hit enter, go to my home directory, and I could type all that again. So that's one way to do it. I could drag and then press the middle mouse button. That'll save me some keystrokes. That's another way to do it. I can also use the up and down arrow keys to go through the last several commands that I've typed. Right? So, so the, the people who implemented command line interfaces, they're, they're not dumb. Right? They know typing out a command line is less speedy than clicking things mouse, 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 mouse. But they try to put as many things in there like tab completion, like being able to press the up arrow to look at the previous commands that you've typed uh, so that you can actually you know, still work effectively even though you're not using the mouse to do things. All right? So I'm going to you know, mouse up and I'm going to press the up and down arrow keys until I find the command I want to type. Now if I hit enter, it's going to open that up. And again, remember this window, now this isn't a good, particularly good PDF, but, but remember the software is being run on my computer, the graphics are being sent over the internet and displayed on the, the local computer here. Right? And so now I can view the PDF file that's on my computer. And I can use it just like I would any other, other, other you know, PDF file. Now, remember, it's, it's sending all that graphical data over the internet. It might not be quite as fast, particularly if you have an extremely slow internet connection. But you know, you're still able to see what, what's in that file. And just like you might use a different program to edit a Word document versus a PDF file versus a text file, the same rules apply here on Linux. Right, so uh, events or acro read, if it were installed, is a very useful way to look at PDF files. If I'm trying to look at a text file, the command I want to use is either less or more. Uh, they both do essentially the same thing. Uh, one might say that less is more. Uh, less has a few extra options than more, but for historical reasons, more came first. And so if I type more, and then test underscore KB, or if you're actually in there following along, you can do the test underscore data. Actually, let's do that. So I'll look at Savannah's test data file. So more slash home slash bootcamp slash 2018 SJW something. And C has the test underscore data file. So here I've specified the complete path to Savannah's test data file. And I'm using the program more to look or display the contents of test underscore data to the screen. And so when I hit enter, it displays the test data. And so you can see it's basically just numbers. But it's just displaying it to the terminal. If it were really, really long, so let's see what else Savannah has in her directory. So she has linear.txt. That's also pretty short. Yeah, binding is going to be short. Hello is going to be short. They're all going to be fairly short. So let's, let's look at the one that's not a text file, right? So I told you that bootcamp.tar.gz is not a text file. It's a, it's a compressed archive. 
So it's going to be a binary file. If I try to display it as a text, it's going to give me gobbledygook. But it's going to give me a lot of gobbledygook, so I'll be able to test out what happens when you have multiple screens being displayed. All right, so we're going to go here to more. And again, if I'm ever at a loss, like what files are in Savannah's directory, I hit tab once, I hit tab twice, and it gives me all the options that I could type. Right? So I want to type boot camp. I'm lazy, so I'm just going to type BO and hit tab. And as I've predicted, lots of gobbledygook. But you can see it's giving me sort of prompts so that I'm not just displaying gobbledygook after gobbledygook after gobbledygook to the page. And if I hit space, it's giving me another page of gobbledygook. If I hit enter, it's giving me another line of gobbledygook. But it's a small distinction when it's gobbledygook. So again, your, your cheat sheet and the Surrey Unix tutorial has all sorts of ways where you can sort of, you know, here are some commands you can run on the Linux command line. You know, if you're viewing copy, the first file is your source file, the second file is the destination file. It gives you a lot of those cues so that you guys can then test out and, and you know, become more familiar with how to run commands at the Unix command line interface. You're not going to be able to learn in a day, right? And, and my students, when they first join the lab, they often sit there with the, the, the cheat sheet or, you know, they have Google open or they, they talk to their friends, and, you know, person next to them. Uh, and it takes them a while, right? It's, it's like learning any other language. And it, and it, is, it is a language, right? Uh, and so you can't go to France and expect to be fluent after a day of time. You have to immerse yourself in it and you have to say, okay, I'm going to do this. And, you know, if you do that and that's the only type of computer that you use or you use that as your primary computer method, you know, after a month, you're going to be fairly proficient. Um, and after a year, you're going to be pretty good. Uh, and after 10 years, you're going to be darn good. But it takes time. And so, so this is basically allowing you to have that door open to you, right? Because the main reason that most people don't learn Linux is not because they're not smart enough to learn Linux. It's just they don't have the easy opportunity to do it, right? And if you never have that software available to you, well, of course, then you're never going to learn it. Uh, and so the goal of this session is sort of give you that exposure so that now you, have a, now you have a system where you can sort of play around with it and get used to it and become better at it. And so then the next time somebody says, oh, well, it would be nice if I could rename these 500 files. Well, you know, I bet there's a way to do that in Linux. And then you'll have a way to sort of, okay, well, if I Google how to rename 500 files in Linux, you'll see that there's probably about seven or eight options that you could do it. Uh, I can come up with three or four right off the top of my head. So, so having that open to you, again, it gives you the, the ability to, to face problems in um, new and pretend, potentially more efficient ways when those problems arise. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of stuff here that we didn't get a chance to do, and that's fine. I never get through this because of all the... Uh, because of all the stuff that, that you know, goes on with getting people's computers set up. Uh, but let's take uh, maybe a five minute break. Um, and so here's you know, just going through some of the, the uh, commands. You can see we've covered some of these. So there's directory listing, change directories, print working directories. There's also some more you know, uh, you know, delete files. You've got to be able to delete files. Um, and so, so this sort of goes through some of the commands. Um, but let's take a five-minute break. Uh, we'll come back, and then we'll do some uh, stuff on model fitting.